Hi everyone. Good morning. So we are about to start this keynote session. Um, it's my great pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker on science communication, Dr. Don Sanders. Don is an associate professor in the University of Gothenburg in Sweden. Don trained in both fine art and ecology, and her PhD focused on botanical gardens as environments for learning. Don has been working across art, science, interface and how such ways of working uh, will allow us to create new attentional frames in teaching and learning context towards plants and notions of plantness. Don serves as uh, editor on the editorial board of the new journal uh, Plants, People and Planet and has just written a, an amazing editorial that I urge everyone to, to, to read. The title is Standing in the Shadows of Plants. So let's please welcome her and get ready to take a different view of things, I think. Thank you, Don. Thank you. Um, <laughs> the clip has broken for the, um, <clears throat> so that's why I'm holding this. I, I'm hopeless at multitasking, so I hope I manage not to fall over, click the slides and hold on to this. Um, as you can hear, I'm British, but I am a Swedish academic. You can. Oh, fantastic idea. How's that? No. Oh, can I push it up? It's okay. Yeah, you can hear? Okay. Um, yeah, as you heard, I, uh, I trained in fine art and ecology, and my PhD was in the geography department, so I'm a woman who walks across lots of borders, and I live in two countries, and Swedish is becoming my second language. <laughs> it's great to be here. I love Lisbon. I've worked here with Professor Justin Dillon on the EU project when I was a postdoc, and I had the pleasure to come here last year for the Botanic Gardens Conference. And I met some fantastic people, some of whom I will talk about in my talk. Is this working OK? Yes. Great. OK, so yep, I've, I really like this idea of uh, ecology across borders. And I'm going to talk about what those borders might be. Um, while I talk, I'm going to throw an analogy into the audience. And I want the person who gets the last two sheets to hold on to those two sheets. Not tear them, just hold on to them. We're going to return to those two sheets. So I'm going to start over here with the analogy. OK, you ready? <laughs> and I want you to just start unraveling it and then just pass it on. It's quite, it's a very recycled loo roll, so um, it may tear. Please don't tear it yet. Just keep passing it around and rolling it out. It's an analogy, and we'll explain it later. It hasn't been used, no. I made sure it was a clean one. So a lot of people have been talking about the sustainable development goals and which ones are most relevant to their talk, and um, I'm no different. Um, I'm going to actually stand over here because I'm left more lefty. Uh, I work mainly with plants, um, so I'm kind of interested in the life on land development goal. But the reason I've put this slide up is not to say I'm referring to this development goal, but to really pay attention to some of the language in this. 
um, because what I want to take us to is a, a less human-centric place today. Um, and what I think is interesting is some of the language in this, like combat desert, des desertification, halt and reverse. That language is, is, is quite, you know, that side of the statement is, is almost a sort of warlike. And then at the beginning, you've got these more nurturing terms like protect, restore. And I think that that's one of the things for science communication in any language is what words are we using to describe our work? Who are we working with in terms of the language that we use? And it's been very interesting for me as someone who's trained in both ecology and fine art to work with an ecologist and artist and educators. And we've had to cross many borders in our research study. And one of the things, if you're, if you're looking at plants, is this whole notion of plant extinction. And um, most recently, there are papers coming out that were developed between the University of Stockholm in Sweden and the Royal Botanic Gardens Q on the fact the accelerated rate of plant extinction. Actually, in the last 250 years, plants are struggling more than we thought. Um, and if you want a reference to that, that is in the editorial, The Standing in the Shadows of Plants. And I urge you to read it. It's a very interesting paper because it, it really talks about how we map that extinction. And it takes a specific time scale. When we, when we communicate the ecology of science, this notion of extinction to people, you know, what kind of language are we going to use? How do we tell that story? And I think one of the most uh, succinct statements about extinction written in the, the recent past is this statement from the, uh, the State of the World Plants Report in 2017. Extinction is an absolute term, meaning that no individual of a species remains alive. <clears throat> and I, I think that's quite a shocking statement if you presented that someone publicly. If you were talking and reflecting back to the general public, how you could actually postulate, you know, what if this was about humans? If you use this statement about humans, which if you are really pessimistic about the future, it could be a possibility. If you added, extinction of humans is an absolute term, meaning that no individual of a species remains alive, what would that do to an audience as a provocation? So the next few slides, I, I want to sort of develop this idea of story and narrative and biography, because the people that I work with in uh, Gothenburg, um, we, we aren't all in Gothenburg University, so the people I work with is uh, Bente Eriksson from Lund Botanic Garden in southern Sweden. She's our ecologist. And then the artists, uh, um, and I hope if anyone's from Iceland here, you will forgive my pronunciation. I, I, I'm roughly in the area, but Brindis uh, Snaisbjörnsdottir. Uh, she's from the University of Fine Art in Iceland and Mark Wilson from Cumbria University in north of England. He's a fine artist. And then my colleagues from Educational Scientists Science, um, Eva Nubai, uh, Irma Brokovic, and Anna Maria Hipkis. So we're, we're pretty pan-European, but we tend to be in the, the north of Europe. And one of the things that we're looking at, Anna Maria Hipkis is very interested in semiotics and language. So one of the things we're looking at is what kinds of narratives make meaning in spaces such as botanic gardens or science centers. And I've always been drawn to this statement by Richard Forty, who, if any of you are into trilobites, you'll know him as a brilliant writer of uh, discussions of the trilobite's eye. And he talks about species having a narrative of their own, a biography, and this fact that the loss of a species isn't just a lower point on a graph of biodiversity, it's the loss of a biography. And I kind of want, would like you to hold that in. How's the toilet roll going? Is it moving around the audience? Yeah? Still going around? No, you keep, keep passing it around and unraveling it. 
Just keep rolling it out. Is it finished? No one left. So you've got the last two squares. Okay, great. That was a small toilet roll. I should have got a, I should have got a bigger one. So as communicators, we need to think about being human. What is it about being human and communicating? Well, as you can see, we're storytelling organisms, and we, we live storied lives. Whenever you meet with your family, your friends, you go to work, what do you share? You share some sort of story. Twitter is just a really compressed story. Sometimes there are links into bigger stories. But what do those stories tell us? And, and Yesterday, I was very interested in this discussion around emotions. Should we, shouldn't we? What kind of emotions? You know, it was, it was the, one of the richest parts of the discussion, I think. And look at those words. Sometimes quietly things are disappearing, sometimes in bright bursts of controversy, chaos and pain. Think about the species that you're working with. What kinds of stories are you needing to share? Have some of you discovered species that have come back that are doing better than they were before? Did anyone see the article in the New York Times w interviewing scientists who've spent many, many years living intimately with organisms and writing about them and getting to know them only for that organism to go extinct? What happens to your stories? What happens to your, your beingness as an ecologist? The art critic John Berger talks about when you're reading a story, you inhabit it. I thought you would like that word as, a, as ecologists. How do you live in the oikos of a story? Okay, so this is, if you want to take one thing away from this morning, this is the thing I would hope you would take away. This is the thing that motivates me to do what I do. And it's a, it's a paragraph by two science educators in America um, Angela Calabrese Barton and Michael Roth, and they've written a really fantastic book called Rethinking Scientific Literacy. And they talk about this idea of the center and the margin, and I think all through yesterday I was thinking, what if we took a less human-centric view of the discussions? What if we started from the viewpoint of a, of a fungi, a plant, a mammal, some uh, snakes or toads, what would the world look like? What would our ecological communication look like? What if we took our public deep into the lives of these organisms and spoke from that place? And that's what Angela and Michael talk about. What does it mean to be positioned in the marginal center? And what are the implications this has for ways of knowing, talking, and acting? And what happens when the center or margin is used to understand, challenge, and collapse the other? So if you as an ecologist stepped away from your humanity and became the toad that you study or the plant that you study and spoke from that space, how can you communicate that to your audience? Would that give them less empathy, more empathy? Okay, this is the sound one, yeah. <coughs> There's a file there, yes. Yeah. Sarah checked it yesterday. Oh, do I just press? No. <coughs> she checked it for me and she said it's there. There you go, just play that, yeah. risk it didn't work it's the sound of storm petrels nesting does anyone does anyone research storm petrels yeah they're they're yeah it's a beautiful sound of hearing them gurgling under the cliff and it worked yesterday but yeah forget it okay let's go on anyway if you ever want that sound file I can but it's stunning and I wanted to saturate you, if you like, in an oral experience that wasn't a human voice, just to see where you go 
in terms of the response to that. Yeah, no, just don't worry. Don't worry, it's a lost. Exciting, but didn't happen. Yeah, she checked it yesterday and it was fine. Don't worry, we'll just go on to the next. Uh, what do I do? Just, just keep going. I just keep going, yeah. Okay, so border crossings and boundary objects. My, my scientific interest, if you like, is carnivorous plants. And they're interesting because they kind of occupy this middle ground. They occupy a middle ground between animal and plant. And Darwin actually said, uh, by Jove, I do believe it's an animal. He even thought at one point it occupied a middle ground. So those kinds of organisms can be interesting to, to place in the middle, you know, about perceptions of what the public think is a plant, is an animal. And Susanna and I were talking about public perceptions. Public per yeah, I have a stutter, sorry, I will get there. Public perceptions of fungi and where they place them. And the trouble is that they used to be grouped by scientists as plants. And that, that occupational space has, has stayed in the psyche of the public. When I came last year, the work of this man really impressed me from Coimbra, uh, Antonio. And he did this really interesting podcast public podcast working with ecologists. It's called Every Plant Has a Name, but he spoke about the questions the public asked. And we often talk about our research questions, where our questions are coming from, finding answers to our questions. But what if we go to the public for their questions? You know, what are the questions they're asking? And I really love question two. Can I have plants in my bedroom? Can I sleep with plants? Is it okay to sleep with plants? Will I be able to breathe okay? There, there are questions that the public are asking of plants. It's a doorway into their curiosity, and we're finding in our research, Nuthikan, curiosity is a really big driver for people meeting plants. Yeah, here's Charles Darwin. He actually wrote that in a letter when he was studying Drosera. He was thinking these thoughts. And Monica Gagliano, some of whom you might know, is on our scientific committee. And she asked us, she said, why don't you cho choose an organism that occupies the middle ground? Why don't you choose something that has this ambiguity between plants and animals to evoke the public even more? And we had a big discussion about that. And the plant scientists said, no, we need to be firmly embedded in plantness. So that has a communication message. Who are we as ecologists? What do we take to the conversation? Are we so firmly rooted in our own organisms or habitats? Are we so in that place that we struggle to cross borders and boundaries? Oops, wrong way. So why the toilet roll? You're probably all thinking, why did she bring that toilet roll? Time and space. One of the big challenges I've found teaching PhD science students at the Natural History Museum in, in, in London is this idea, how do you bring deep time to the public? You know, what's the average lifespan of a human? It's, it's, it's over. It's not very long, is it? I mean, it's longer than an insect, but it's, in terms of deep time, it's, it's short. So how can you take people into that space? So who's got the last two squares? Yeah? So, and we're all, can everyone lift up the pieces of toilet roll you've got? Can you lift it above your heads? Okay. And here's the last two squares. God, I really chose a bad toilet roll. <laughs> right, if you hold on to that. So this is the, that's humanity. That is humanity. That's what we're, we're dealing with. Now, I haven't mathematically done this, but you can mathematically do it. If you go online, there are particularly people working in geological science that will tell you what toilet roll you need to buy, how many sheets, and work it all out. So this is not, for those of you who are into statistical modeling, I, I admit, this is illus illustrative, not mathematical. But basically, that's us. All of us, yeah. That's humanity, that's, that's our history. 
But look at what we've done in that time. That's scary, isn't it? That's us. And all of you have got models in your head of how much we've done to impact on the non-human world. Everyday thing, which Ariane talked about yesterday. How do we transform the ordinary? How do we take everyday things and make our science public? Um, thank you, toilet roll people. <laughs> Obrigada to the women and obrigado to the men. One of my colleagues in Gothenburg, some of you might know, Helena Pedersen, and she's really uh, uh, active in critical animal studies, and she often asks this question of us, where are the animals in the sociology of climate change? And then I counter her, where are the plants? And we have this constant debate. But it's a question I throw out to you as well as ecologists. And, and yesterday, I think there was a bit of a debate, was that, are we moving into social science with this discussion? And that is a, a really powerful question to ask of ourselves in ecology. Where are the animals in the sociology of climate change? And that is a space in which interdisciplinarity can really grow and evolve. And of course, where are the plants? So yes, someone, uh, Susanna mentioned the special issue. So it's taken a year to put together. It came out on Friday, which was very exciting just before this started. Uh, why the title? And now I'm really not sure if I can pronounce Peter's surname, but I'm going to have a, have a go. I'm not sure about the V in his surname. I think it's uh, Vujakovic. And he's written a paper critiquing representations of deep geological time in terms of them being animal-centric. And he says we should have more phytocentric representations. So this got me thinking about the presence of plants over time and what we should call the special issue. So we've called it standing in the shadows of plants to recognize the longevity of plants on Earth. And then we're revisiting an educational theory called plant blindness, which was developed in the late 20th century by Jim Wandersee and Elizabeth Schusler, who are American biologists and educators. And we wanted to move on from their, their presentation of the theory and develop it further. And we wanted to do that by inviting people across many disciplines. So if you look at the journal, you will find papers like Giovanni Alloy's paper on um, race and the plant, planting of uh, squares in Milan and how it was seen as the Africanization of uh, Italian cities. So plants becoming symbols of the other and being other themselves. Gitanjali Satjev's paper on plant representations in, in uh, cities in India in terms of being on taxi doors, being on advertising. Where is the plant? Is that an opportunity for public pedagogy about plants? Various people reviewing plant blindness in conservation activities. For instance, are our, are our laws animal biased in terms of trade? illegal trade? Is there plant blindness in our policy? What about food? You know, how can we bring plant blindness to the table in terms of food? And what about the term plant blindness itself? That has been critiqued. It was a metaphor, but it could be seen as being uh, uh, disabilist and problematic. So people are now talking about other ways, and there's a group of Americans that have suggested plant love as a way of but then we've got the emotion question coming back. So what plants are we using to tell our stories? And I really love Nicholas Harbour because he talks about, he worked for, for many years in a lab with uh, Arabidopsis, the fruit fly of the botanist, and he wanted to get outside the lab and revisit the living plant. And what I think is interesting, and it came up earlier today, is this idea of the common and the familiar do we really need to go back to the common plant and become familiar with it? Because maybe the common is just as unfamiliar to us as the rare. And can the common plant, the common animal, be a doorway into biodiversity? Those stories about pigeons and rats, you know, are they as powerful in bringing people's attention to the non-human world? 
So how do we see beyond the science, see beyond ecology? And Brindis and Mark, I think, are, are, are really exciting in the way that they talk about building a sort of relational paradigm in which humans are just a player. They're just one actor amongst many. What if we have more of a circular way of looking at the world rather than a triangle? What happens if we make that circle 3D? How do we speak to each other? So the research that we've done, it was funded by Vedenskabr Audit, which is the Swedish Research Council, and, and that, that was for three years. We finished it last year, and part of it was doing installations um, in the Botanic Garden. They had three installations, and one of them was a series of scanning electron microscope photographs of seeds, 14 seeds. And I, I think it's fascinating the way they present those seeds, because they... The seed is the dominant narrative in this image. The adult plant is reduced to a monochrome at the back. And that little footnote that you're thinking, wonder what it is, is an interview with the scientist who collected the seed. So they've flipped the story. They've brought a thing that's usually invisible, very much the foreground, something that we, we look at quite a lot and sort of go towards the adult plant. They've pushed to the back. And then the human collector has just become a scientific footnote. In the same gallery, they had the living seeds in an installation growing. And then you walked through the garden to this building called Stolborden, which is like a big barn, and the floorboards don't fit very well. So when you're standing in that barn, you can smell soil. It goes up your nose, it's in your body, it's present in the building. It's just damp, soily soil. If any of you work with soil, you know exactly that. You know that smell when you've got really humic, slightly damp soil, particularly in Sweden? And they did a massive, massive, massive print. Ariane, can I borrow you for a minute? Yeah, can you just stand there? We'll just get rid of humanity. Um, just stand there. And this print was... Oh yeah. This print was that long. It was huge. And basically, it was one seed made large. It took 29 separate scans of Stipa Panata, and they gradually put them all together in Photoshop, and it was this high, and it took four of us to unravel it and put it up. So as soon as the door opened in Stolpold, and you were confronted, thank you, thank you about that. <laughs> you were confronted by this thing, and one of the things we're researching is, uh, what are your impressions here? That was it. That was our question because we wanted to keep it open. And so for each installation, we've asked people, mainly teacher students, some members of the public, what are your impressions here? And this one caused a lot of problems for people. Why, why do you think it caused so many problems? Because the scale changed really confused people. They thought it was an animal. And there's obviously something about plantness, plantiness, plants, that we don't see them made large. We're not confronted by a, a large-scale image of them. And I think that's something for those of us who work with plants. We need to think about when we're communicating about them. How do we make plants public, large, confrontational, provocative, not that mute, silent thing in the corner? Yeah. How fast can you click your fingers? Who's the fastest finger clicker here? Too slow. How many people know your tricularia, the, um, the bladder wart, the, the valve traps? That is like slow motion for a bladder wart trap. It's a plant. It's not moving slowly. In fact, it's so fast, we need very specialized video to, to, to see it, to witness it as scientists. They've only recently managed it. And yet our stereotype picture of plants is they're really, really slow. And that's a problem when you're communicating. So what we've, we kept up with the scale thing, though, because we like this provocation, confrontation with plantness. This is where I work. Uh, this building here, it's a big square building with lots of windows. It wouldn't last five minutes in Lisbon because you'd boil, but in Sweden we like the light. So, and it's 14 meters high. It's a wall tapestry of, of the Stipa Panata. 
So as students come in, they were confronted by this, this giant element of plantness. And we wanted to provoke them. And people would stand on the ba balconies when we hung it and ask, what is it? What are you doing? And there was this amazing dialogue thrown around the space because we'd broken the space and we brought in the agency of the plant. And then this is uh, Brindis on the left and Mark on the right. And this is one of the questions we've been discussing as a research group. How might taking a different view improve our understanding and sensitivity to the lives of plants? And this is why artists are involved in our project. Because we're interested in physical, visual views and how that can puncture, disrupt. We heard that word disrupt just how can it disrupt the space between humans and plants? We're so different from plants. I mean, we're pretty far away from plants. So we don't want to make plants become human, as uh, Hule writes in her lovely philosophical essay. But we want to bring plantness and plantiness out. It's OK, I'm not going to sing Dinah Ross. <laughs> so I'm going to end with just a series of questions for you, really. And it does build on yesterday's debate about emotions. This idea of witnessing and experiencing. You know, how does extinction feel? I think that is an important thing. You know, I don't think we can do a binary of those are the facts, those are emotions. We need to bring those two together. But it's, it's how we tell the stories, how we engage with the different actors in the stories. And we heard a lot yesterday about stakeholders, but they were nearly all human. What about the non-human, the more than human world? And you're probably thinking, if anyone's from Ireland here, you're probably thinking, why has she brought James Joyce here? It's one of my favorite short stories. But this, this line, I think, it captures our humanity. But it also provokes us to think about empathy. How can ecologists write science in ways that bring the human towards the science in order to have empathy and emotion? Her eyes gave him no sign of love or farewell or recognition. We need to engage with some of those emotions and feelings. We need to learn to recognize the more than human world. I have a friend in America I work with, and her friend is uh, he's a bacteriologist. He has stopped using the word I. He calls himself we. And as ecologists, you'll understand why that shift in his pronoun. We are we. I know that I'm speaking about science communication, and I wanted to leave with, with I think, one of my most favorite paragraphs in science communication. It was originally written in 1988, but this morning we saw a lot about um, marine uh, ecology and urban marine ecology, and <coughs> the Journal of Marine Pollution was one of the journals that were up there. And this was then picked up in the early 2000s in, uh, I think it's Deepak, review of uh, plastic pollution. And he re-presented -re this. And I think it's an exquisite piece of science writing. And I think it relates to the James Joyce. Particularly if you're miles out in the middle of the ocean with no human witness, what happens to your story? Who's going to inhabit your story? Where is that story going to go? And for me, the, uh, the jellyfish made of polystyrene that capture the wind through the door as we come in each day to the conference, they're floating on that sea of possibility. They're giving a sense of what if, maybe. And I want to leave now with, uh, we have a, in fact, Ariane is his supervisor, Kassahun Velleman Vel. Bell de Mariam, and he's written a really lovely paper in Discourse Studies, and he talks about being with and becoming with. And I think for ecology, we've got a three-stage communication journey, knowing about, being with, and becoming with. And in that journey, we have to weave in the other human beings on the planet. And I think that bringing artists, ecologists, educators, poets, can help us to make that.
that journey. We need an ecological version of, and I'm going to try and say her name, Paula Hrego, the Portuguese painter. You know how she has those really rich narratives about humans. Well, her crow is very crow. We need an artist like that in the scientific community to bring those rich narratives of possibility, complexity, and story to the scientific world. And I hope with the special issue, we did just a tiny drop of that. But I'm really excited by what this conference can achieve over the next week in terms of where we take the story, the stories, and all the languages that we have, and all the species we're working with beyond the human world. But we need to be able to take those stories into the human world for the humans to understand about the two sections of toilet paper and what we've done to the world. But we need to have hope and love. So I guess leave it with Raymond Carver. What do we do when we talk about love? I just wanted to leave that and then, yeah. You sure? We try. Oh, okay, we're just going to try the sound one more time. It's good to leave leave it with a non-human, uh, a non-human sound. I'm sorry about the stutter. The p words are always. I try and avoid them, but sometimes you can't. <laughs> That's feedback. Sorry, that's, no, it's not. No. <laughs> Lost in translation, no. It's okay. The computer, the computer do not recognize the sound. Oh, okay, no worries. Sarah's did, but this, never mind, yeah. Computer. Okay. Yeah, no. Um, yeah. We'll sort it out. We'll put it somewhere so you can pick it up at another time. No, I don't have it. No, I'm not that fancy. Yeah. I really want the Storm Petrels to be here. Yeah, I know. It's a beautiful, um, it's a beautiful piece of sound. Yeah, I know. There was a moment where I, I was tempted, and I thought, no. <laughs> yeah, you can have humanity. <laughs> Ariane and I worked together. We did work together in uh, Gothenburg. Brilliant. Hi, Dawn. Hi. Um, I work in southwestern Portugal. I'm looking at land degradation in Natura 2000 areas, and I have a question which I would like to ask to you, but also to the audience. Very often, we, as you mentioned up above, we tend to think that 
d extinction happens in the deep oceans that we don't know about. How many of us know that underneath our very feet, the soil, we are suffering massive extinctions yeah. because of the way we treat soil. We look at soil as a non-living entity and uh, we are actually uh, destroying the very fabric that supports our, our food systems in this country. And uh, for me, it's frightening. And uh, I wonder how many ecologists actually focus on the living organisms underneath our feet as opposed to the living organisms that we can physically see. Thank you. Yeah, there, um, one of my favorite David Attenborough comments was we know more about, um, I think it was, yeah, he talked about life on the moon and he talked about the deep sea, but he also has talked about life in soil. And E.O. Wilson worked with a photographer in Central Park. It was called the One, their Imperial One Foot Project. And they dug uh, squares out and then documented all the living things in the soil underneath. It was a fantastic project. And I don't think that project is used enough to bring the world of soil to, um, and it, uh, to the public. And I agree with you, I think soil is a fantastic place and, and should be, you know, our feet walk over it all the time. And, and one of the things I didn't say earlier that I think is important is that we tend to look at the world from our eye level or even this now. And, and one of the projects we do with our teachers is using mirrors to get the canopy onto the mirror to get a different view. And, and I think that's what ecology can do. It can present a different view. And soil is one of the places that we really, it's underexposed. I agree with you. It'd be interesting to see what ecologists here say about uh, bringing the world of soil to public. I nearly, I nearly used the no, phrase "winter is coming," and I yeah. An example of Ramsay Bolton, the yeah. worst ever person in the world. No? Yeah. And uh, I was to try to find a moment in the in the in the movie that says, "On compassion, never have been in compassion." But and it's a moment that is in com on compassion with Sansa and Lawrence Snow, so the guys that I you saw the, the movie rolling. You remember that? It takes two seconds, and that's all. So my, my question is, how you will pass the message to people that doesn't like art, doesn't like poetry, doesn't, it's not educated? Because I think that this is the, this is the question today. To yeah. pass the message to these guys, well, it's easy, but how to pass the message to Donald Trump? Yeah, one of... <laughs> Some, some of the other work that I do looks at things like Pokemon cards and games and stuff and finding, finding connections with those. But I agree with you. And um, I think we should use like everyday TV moments to, to, bring, to, bring, to try and bring compassion and empathy. But I, I can think of two things. I can think of, I once, when I lived in London, I was walking from the station and there was a triangle of soil with uh, small daisies and you could just ignore it. It was just, it wasn't anything much. And I watched a child walk past with an adult and they stopped and the child went like this and then went like that and they bent down to look at it and then the child got hold of a petal of the daisy and bent it over to show the little pink fleck there and then they stayed there talking and then they moved on. And I think that one of the things for having compassionate moments and empathy is that we have to start very, very young in education because, because everyone has a very basic education and that's where we need to start ecology and empathy and compassion. And I've also seen horrible things where children just pick up something and just rip it to pieces and stamp on it. 
And there was a woman, uh, Suzanne Isaacs, in the 1920s and 30s, who said, we need to look at both, the, the will to cherish and the will to destroy, and look at how those come together. And Game of Thrones is an interesting one, because there are moments of compassion, but there's a lot of destroying, isn't there? Would you use Game of Thrones to communicate compassion? <laughs> Why not? I mean, you've seen it, so it's popular. I, I, I show my compassion moment for the Real Madrid fans. Okay. <laughs> oh, yeah, I'm, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Football is interesting, yeah. If there is someone in the audience, I can evangelize. <laughs> So, uh, what do you think about the role of uh, animation movies in communicating conservation problems? <laughs> Thank you. Think about what was the first bit? The animation movies. Oh yeah. The animation, animation movies, problems, yeah. yeah. Uh, for yeah. instance, uh, we, uh, Disney just released the remake of uh, Lion King. Yeah. And uh, for me, that uh, doesn't communicate many of the problems that lions and other species are facing. Yeah, I think animation, um, as a I think animation is, is useful and it could be used better. I'm thinking more like Avatar is an interesting one. There's been a lot of uh, people discussed Avatar as a potential conservation message, if you like. Um, I really love the French movie Microcosmos. You know, but is that, and that was an unusually popular film. People did go to the cinema and watch it. Um, and there's hardly any lines in it at all. Uh, time, must, time passes differently here. That's about the biggest line that's spoken. Everything else is like a whole load of insects and plants doing their thing. So I think animation can, um, can take us to places that we may not go to. What's the one, Honey, I Shrunk the Kids? fantastic for inserting people into what it's like to be a very small insect on a lawn when a human is mowing it mm -hmm. and you're trying to get away but you know Disney is not perfect it's run by a capitalist machine and it's got investments in the worldview they're presenting I mean it would be great if we 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 did an extinction rebellion into a Disney studio and said we're going to rewrite the narrative but it, that's the thing in science communication. Where are the animators in this room? Why don't we build relationships with animators? Manga comics. Very cool. Yeah. Do you, is that something you're interested in? <laughs> yeah, why not? I mean, why not? I think comics, you know, they have a very pictorial way of presenting something. And that bubble of text. It's such a small, succinct space to really ask that question. You know, it's the Game of Thrones moment in a comic. Well, I think w what I would do is I would go to your nearest art college and hang out with the graphic designers and the anime people and, and also the people that do uh, street art and graphics and engage them in conversations, you know, because some of it is about representation. If you don't have those conversations, it's a world they're not representing because they haven't had the conversations. I, I think it's very important to... Uh, I was a youth worker for a long time in London and um, was just out in these urban spaces working with young people. They weren't ecologists or connected to nature, but we had amazing conversations about identity and the ecological world, and the social and the ecological were, were connecting. Felix Guattari talks about the three ecologies, mental ecology, social ecology, and environmental ecology, and I think his model is very powerful. And we're all used to sort of multidimensional models of habitats, communities, and po populations, why don't we try taking those models into our science communication and working with graphics and different things? 
and going to the youth clubs and asking people, like Antonio did, what are your questions? You know, when I, you know, you laughed when I said, can I sleep with plants in my bedroom? But how would you answer that question as an ecologist? We, we mustn't laugh at the questions, why are plants green? You know, we need to be able to speak in a conversation that's like going down to have a coffee or in the pub, have a good deep conversation about these things and not be ecologists talking to the person who asked the question, can I sleep with plants in my bedroom? Does that help? So I, I want to ask you a question that I grapple with all the time, both as a father and as an ecologist. On the one hand, we have uh, the death of nature experience that our, our youth and we are retracting or distancing ourselves from nature and we're losing our sympathy for nature. And our, on the other hand, we have the uh, take only photographs and leave only footprints. When we actually go out into nature, we're not allowed to touch anything. We're not so I ask my students all the time, you're in a national park and a turtle crosses the path and your son asks you to pick it up to investigate it. Do you let him? because we're not supposed to touch anything because we might pass a disease on or otherwise. But on the other hand, our son doesn't want to come on walks if he's not a, allowed to touch anything. How would you deal with that? Yeah, I think, um, God, I sound like I just read all the time, but there's a Finnish architecture writer called Johani Palasma, and he's written a beautiful book called In the Eyes of the Skin. And he wrote it in around 2000, I think it was, and I heard him speak and he said, we are moving in our cities. We're, we're not touching things anymore. We're built, making buildings of glass, and we're obsessed with seeing things. Everything's about seeing things. Vision, we don't run our fingers along a wall or touch a bark. We don't build buildings to hear the sound of the human voice. We want to muffle it. We don't want to smell things anymore or taste them. We just want to look, and everything's about the visual. And that had a massive influence on me, and I started thinking about where is education going, and particularly nature-based education, because the haptic, we've got skin. Skin is an amazing sensing organ. So I think there needs to be a balance between things. And um, yesterday in the hotel, I, there's a very good example of plastic plants, and I thought they were real. I really thought they were real. They were good. They were good, so I was like, and even at the first touch, I wasn't sure. <laughs> but then I did, in fact, me and Anne did a whole, like, is this real? <laughs> and I couldn't have really figured that out with just my eyes, you know. And what about people who, are, who can't see, you know? That is their world. So I think, I think one of the issues is we need to become multi-sensory again. I think working with artists has really taught me that. And the other thing is, I, I'm not anti-mobile phones because they are, people are really looking at things with their cameras and you can get these little lenses now. So that, if you look on the Instagram, plants are becoming much more public through photography. But I would, I would say, uh, in, if you talk to your son about how touching that organism, what impacts it has on that organism, and the ways in which to touch the organism, then I would encourage touch. And I think that what we're finding, I think some of the, the tension between us and nature, nature, is that we're not touching anymore. And, and we're losing that, you know, our education is so much about words. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's become a metaphor for something else. But I, yesterday, David Navarro talked about the texture of the snow in the Arctic Circle and the skidoos and the melting snow, that, that's a really important, there's an essay called Sensing Science. You know, our senses are important measures of what's going on around us. I encourage you to read the, the work of Natalie Myers. She, she's done a lot of work on the senses and science and embodiment. She danced her PhD, but she's also trained, I think she's in microbiology, yeah. Is that? And that okay? An answer. There's, lo there's lots of, I mean, there's always many answers. That's the beauty of it, yeah. Yeah, we need to go and eat. Thank you. But I think we can continue the talks during lunchtime and breaks. So thank you, everyone, for coming.
Regatta. Hi, hi again. I'll be boring you several times during the Congress, so. Um, there is a lost phone, a jacket and a purse at the check-in desk. Okay. And during coffee breaks and lunch, the LifeWatch team will be doing some uh, presentations at the cinema area. So pass by to see what's what they are presenting. In the afternoon, there is a mistake the in the room. The session called microbial zooming in microbial ecology. Okay, it will be in room two dot two dot twenty one. Okay, I'll I'll show you. Yes. No room for it. No. Para ir a tirar esta.